National Historic Site. Uh, we have, we're really excited to have an in-person audience and as well as an online audience. We are um, honored to be here, to be here with Dr. Taylor and uh, Cornell ILR. The TR site is where Theodore Roosevelt's presidency started in the aftermath of uh, McKinley's assassination. He was sworn in right here in Buffalo. It's very uh, unexpected ceremony and we share that uh, history with more than a normal year more than 20,000 visitors a year we are uh, have various programming our speaker night is a monthly fourth Tuesday event and we're thrilled it's been a, we've been doing this while we partnered with Cornell ILR in June and we welcome their students we welcome um, them to uh, to the TR site and we're thrilled to resume that partnership after uh, the pandemic. It's been a real honor. I'm actually going to, so after thanking everyone for being here, I'm going to uh, turn this over to Kathy Creighton, who will be introducing our speaker. So my name is Kathy Creighton. I'm the director of the Cornell um, ILR office in Buffalo. And I want to recognize the two uh, deans from the ILR school, from Cornell ILR school, Ariel Avgar and Alex Colvin, are here with us uh, tonight to support um, our Buffalo office and our Buffalo community, uh, especially in the aftermath of uh, 514. So thank you very much, both of you, for coming. It really means a lot to me personally and to um, to the community here. I also want to recognize the Cornell Club of Buffalo. Um, is Kelly here? Kelly is the incoming president of the Cornell Club of Buffalo. The Cornell Club is the first, uh, Buffalo's Cornell Club is the first uh, club in the United States. And um, I hope when these students graduate that some of them join their local Cornell clubs. So we have with us tonight, uh, in addition to you all, 24 undergraduate students from Cornell University. They are um, what we call the high road uh, fellows. They, are, they apply for a position, mostly from the ILR school at Cornell, and they come to Buffalo and they do uh, work with uh, community engaged learning with social justice organizations um, around Buffalo, and they add so much to our community, the work they do is really invaluable and I want to thank them for coming to Buffalo and for the work they do, which includes uh, work such as uh, lead poisoning of children, um, community uh, uh, public transportation, housing, uh, the rights of formerly uh, people who were formerly in the uh, criminal justice system, and, and on and on. And so the work they do is really incredible. One high roader uh, wrote so eloquently about uh, just the brief time that she has been in Buffalo, and I want to quote her. It's Finley Williams, who's sitting right here. Uh, Finley wrote, I think that our discussions of the East Side and Buffalo as a whole, that, uh, that in our discussions of the East Side and Buffalo as a whole, my peers and I must keep the possible in mind. In fact, I believe the work we're doing here in Buffalo is an ode to the possible. I just want that to sink in a little bit, an ode to the possible. Um, and that really optimistic note leads me to introduce why we're all here, which is uh, to um, hear from Dr. Henry Lewis Taylor, Jr. Um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, this talk is sponsored each year, as Lenora said, uh, between the TR site and Cornell. Um, and we generally bring in a Cornell University professor to speak at this event, but this year um, your work, we just felt was so critical for you to um, come and speak to our community and, and us um, in light of your ex extensive work um, working in Buffalo and the black community um, and the obvious need that we have to learn from you um, and to do better. And it's also appropriate uh, that Cornell is sponsoring this event because it was a Cornellian who motivated and guided Dr. Taylor in his life's work 
Uh, Dr. Taylor's father received his PhD from Cornell University in 1954, and Dr. Taylor's father always challenged him to use his skills and talents in service of black people and to help build a better, more just, and humane world. And that's what Dr. Taylor has been doing for the last four decades. And we're so grateful that uh, and fortunate that most of your impressive body of work has right, occurred right here in the Buffalo Niagara region. Uh, Dr. Taylor's work focuses on the connection between activism and scholarship to bring about social change. Uh, that's exactly what we're trying to, uh, to teach these students here this summer, so it's really incredible, um, this connection. Um, while you have an enormous body of work, Dr. Taylor, we're going to focus tonight on his seminal study of uh, Black Buffalo, which took place over 30 years ago and was followed up in a report published at the end of 2021 entitled The Harder We Run, The State of Black Buffalo from 1990 to Present. We're really humbled that you've accepted this opportunity to speak to us um, and that through your work we can learn from our errors. Um, I'm using your words here. You, we can learn from our errors, miscalculation, and flaws in thinking to improve the problem facing the black community. We all hear hunger to do something, um, and what I love about your work, Dr. Taylor, is that you offer easily understandable recommendations um, that we can all get behind. Um, and so I'm really anxiously looking forward to hearing from you tonight, Dr. Taylor. I'm here. Can you hear me? I want to thank you for that uh, very fine introduction and surprise comment about my dad, who was a, a Cornell graduate in a very important year, 1954, uh, a moment that changed uh, American history uh, for the better. And someone that was always bothering me, uh, he would come up to me and say, son, what victories will you win for humanity? <laughs> I said, Dad, what you talking about? I'm five. <laughs> I don't even know what humanity is, man. What's wrong with you? Uh, but he figured eventually that I figured it out, and I'll always thank him for that. And so I want to thank you for inviting me here to uh, share with you my reflections on the report of The Harder We Run. The Harder We Run was more than a report to determine if Black Buffalo had made progress over the past 30 years. It also sought to determine how the city building process affected Blacks, community growth, and socioeconomic development. And moreover, the report intended to, to find out if 27 years of rule under two liberal democratic mayors made a difference in black life. The heart of Iran shows that black Buffalo has not progressed over the past three decades. For example, the average household income, home ownership, and poverty rates are unchanged, while the unemployment rate remains in double digits. Only 31% of blacks 16 years of age and older hold full-time year-round jobs. And these workers are trapped in the low-wage sector of the labor market. Lastly, an indeterminate number of workers discouraged dropped out of the labor force all together. Educational attainment, attainment was also a factor. The percentage of blacks completing high school increased significantly, and there was a big jump in the number of African Americans going to college and graduating, but they still lag considerably behind their white counterparts. Meanwhile, blacks 25 years of age and older over 30% of them had some college, but no degree. 
a significant number of people were getting into higher education, but not getting out. They were not graduating. These advancements notwithstanding, after 30 years, there were still more blacks without a high school diploma than a college degree. At the same time, during this 30-year period, the black uh, middle class continued to grow, although at a much slower rate. And that black middle class went on to acquire considerable political power. However, they were not able to use this political power to transform or change the conditions affecting the black masses. So consequently, in 2021, as in 1990, blacks lived on the economic edge Everything changed, but everything remained the same. The harder they ran, the farther they fell behind. Well, almost a year has passed since the release of The Harder We Run in September 2021. In tonight's presentation, I'll offer a reflective analysis of Black Buffalo. The presentation will be in three parts. The first part analyzes the racist forces thwarting the advancement of Black Buffalo over the last 30 years. The second part recommends a series of projects that could bring about the East Side's radical transformation. While in the final sector, I comment briefly on the impact of Buffalo's racist city building process on blacks and the role of mayoral leadership in facilitating radical change on the east side. Understanding why black Buffalo has not progressed over the past 30 years starts with unpacking racial residential segregation. Buffalo is the sixth most segregated city in the United States. <coughs> but it was not always that way. Before World War II, blacks and white immigrants shared residential space on the Lower East Side. Blacks and white uh, immigrants, they not only lived in the same neighborhoods, but sometimes they even lived in the same uh, boarding houses. This is on Jefferson Street. The historian Lillian Williams tells us that some blacks down on the east side, they even learned how to speak German so they could hang out and party with the Germans. However, all that changed following World War II. What happened? What went wrong? The rise of mass home ownership produced the modern system of racial residential segregation. The reason is that creating mass home ownership as a tool of wealth production required developing a housing and residential land valuation system to guide the decision of mortgage brokers. That task failed to Frederick M. Babcock in 1930s. Babcock used whiteness and social class exclusivity to determine the value of housing and residential lands. He theorized that neighborhoods had life cycles. They were born, they grew, they declined, and eventually turned into slums, which in his world meant uh, death. Babcock theorized that the mere presence of blacks in these neighborhoods triggered their rapid decline and eventual transformation into a slum. Now, Babcock also said that white immigrants had a negative effect on, uh, on neighborhood uh, development, but it was not as harmful as that of blacks. 
So, in Babcock's housing and residential land valorization system, it had a race and a class component. In this system, as the percentage of whites and social class exclusivity increased, so did housing values. Likewise, on the flip side, as housing values declined as the percentage of blacks and social class inclusivity increased in a community. In this city building approach, whites occupied the most desirable and expensive residential lands, while blacks lived on the most undesirable and cheapest residential lands. Moreover, in this uh, uh, approach, housing value became the, the hub around which neighborhood development was catalyzed. Consequently, white communities had the best parks, playgrounds, amenities, schools, institutions, schools, stores, employment centers, and access to goods and services. These developed neighborhoods, in turn, gave whites a competitive edge in every aspect of American life and culture. Thus, in this system of American apartheid, the tethering of race, profits, and wealth to neighborhood development spawned the modern system of racial residential segregation and gave whites a possessive investment in it. Locally, after World War II, when mass home ownership took root, thousands of whites in Buffalo City migrated to Erie County's suburban home ownership zone, while whites, blacks, moved into the central city. By 2017, According to the Brookings Institute, Buffalo was now the sixth most segregated city in the United States. The overrepresentation of whites in the suburbs produced this pattern of residential segregation. For example, by 2020, only 17% of Erie County whites lived in Buffalo City compared to 76% of African Americans. If you look carefully at this chart, you will see Babcock's theory operationalized here in Erie County. So that as these communities became increasingly white and social class exclusivity became a factor of life, values went up as they became increasingly black and inclusive values went down. So Clarence, which has less than 5% of white blacks, is at the top of the list. And Buffalo, with some 37% of African Americans, is at the bottom of the list. The tethering of race, profits, wealth production creates neighborhood segregation. So blacks resided mainly on the east side on the cheapest and most undesirable land in Erie County. Within this context, a high rent wall confined blacks to the east side or central city neighborhoods where the conditions were similar. Simply put, black were stuck in space. Racial residential segregation was not benign. It, it trapped blacks in these marginalized, underdeveloped neighborhood. And this entrapment turned the east side into a site of predatory investment and activities designed to extract wealth 
retard development, increase dependency, and disempower the people. In this context, these underdeveloped east side neighborhoods became factories that produced workers who were willing to accept low paying jobs with limited benefits and no possibility of advancement. This process of systemic neighborhood underdevelopment produced a series of root problems that drive the intergenerational oppression and exploitation of black buffalo. Therefore, the only way to develop the east side and turn it into a great place to live is to attack and eliminate these root problems. I want to stress that these root problems form social determinants of undesirable health and educational outcomes and a range of other socioeconomic problems, including violence and premature death. In the remaining time, I'm going to discuss the five, five critical root problems facing black buffalo. Substandard housing, disintegrating neighborhood infrastructure, lack of control over land and neighborhood development, structural joblessness and low incomes, and a new one the planning and implementation of symbolic Fix the East Side projects. Substandard housing is one of the most critical root problems facing black buffalo. Rent gouging and underdeveloped and unhealthy homes are the characteristic features of this problem. Rent gouging refers to people paying 36% or more of their income on substandard housing, and it drives our, uh, housing insecurity on Buffalo's east side. In a pioneering study, Princeton's Matthew Desmond and MIT's Nathan Wilmers found that property owners generated hyper-profits from their rental properties in underdeveloped neighborhoods. They accomplished this feat by deferring maintenance and charging high rents. The profits came from the financial gap between the lower maintenance and the higher rents. This intertwining of low quality housing and high rents suggests that a similar process is occurring on Buffalo's east side. Most east side residents are paying 30% or more of their income on housing, with 36% paying 50% or more on rent. And in some east side neighborhoods, people are paying a whopping 70% of their income on uh, uh, some place to stay. So this rent gouging matters because when people spend a significant portion of their income on housing, they have much less money to purchase essential items, transportation, food, health care, medicine, and the like. So these high rents are the prime source of residential instability on the east side. For example, For example Buffalo, Buffalo has, has the highest, highest eviction, eviction rate, rate in New, New York, York State. State. And, and the east side leads the way. way. By, by the way, these tickets come from City Hall. Get they don't discuss it. These are City Hall's tickets. In addition to evictions, an indeterminate number of black workers, black renters are moving constantly to avoid rent or to escape very bad living conditions. 
The constant movement of families is a source of neighborhood instability and a significant disruptor of black life on Buffalo's east side. There is an association between rent gouging and unhealthy homes on the east side. As I said before, these predatory landlords make money by uh, ignoring maintenance. Now, most studies of housing conditions in Buffalo use a windshield survey of external conditions to evaluate housing. While imperfect, this system still gives us considerable insight into the quality of east side housing. In 2016, the city of Buffalo did a survey of 70,500 housing units. About 77% of these units range from average to distress. And on the east side, residential structures range from moderately to severely distressed. Now in low demand neighborhoods like those in the light purple and dark purple, 90% of the housing units were in some state of despair, decay, and decline. Our studies at the Center for Urban Studies confirm the city's assessment. And we conclude that most East Side Blacks now live in substandard, unhealthy homes that are often infested with rats, roaches, and other rodents. These housing conditions matter because they are associated with a wide range of health conditions, including toxic stress, sleep deprivation, respiratory infection, asthma, lead poison, infant mortality, and mental health. Luann Brown of the Perinatal Health Network shared this testimonial with me to concretize this interplay between high rents and unhealthy homes. One of her clients said, my experience is on that part of me is not good because I was living in the chipping paint coming off the walls. I also had roaches and other bugs, not good at all. I hated living there. My kids were always sick. I had to throw away my food every day from the refrigerator because the roaches would get in. I wanted to move so bad. I was not able to move because I did not have enough room. The rents are too high. This mother was finally able to move to the town guard where rents were lower and the units were in better conditions. Unfortunately, this mother's story is a story shared by many of the East Side mothers and other women. I want to stress that these substandard housing conditions exist because the city of Buffalo does not enforce its existing housing codes and it has never established a good housing standard between, beneath which no housing unit should be allowed to fall. The east side, sidewalk infrastructure. Those of you who know the east side would probably suggest that I'm exaggerating not exaggerated. Uh, many, if not most, of these sidewalks are in distance back. Now, this situation matters because the east side is a walking community. A significant number of people don't own cars, so they walk. And the sidewalk is the primary pathway for inner neighborhood trips and journeys to and from the bus stop. Thus, these decrepit sidewalks create unnecessary hardships on the residents. For example, these sidewalks are difficult to use when pushing a stroller. 
are carrying groceries or even just walking. And you certainly don't want to go jogging on. Moreover, the sidewalks are dangerous for the elderly and impossible for the visually impaired to navigate. If you're visually impaired, you can't move on those sidewalks. And it's especially problematic because you don't have the federally mandated curve cuts. Can't use a wheelchair, a scooter, a walker, or other mobility devices. So on the east side, you'll see a lot of people in wheelchairs out in the middle of the street, going up and down those streets, all up in harm's way. And in the wintertime, with these long bubbles, <laughs> those sidewalks are impassable, and everybody's out in the street in harm's way. The lack of a green infrastructure is also a significant side problem. Major thoroughfares such as the Kensington Expressway, Sycamore Broadway, Williams Best, East Ferry, Delavan, and Bailey Avenue bring an endless caravan of cars, polluting vehicles throughout the east side on a daily basis. If you look at here, you can see there are almost no trees all up in there protecting the people from that pollution. And so the lack of this green infrastructure matters because it contributes to the heat island effect, water intrusion, the flooding of houses, and because high levels of air pollution are strongly associated with cardiovascular disease, adverse birth conditions, and contributes to asthma and other respiratory diseases. Now I like to show this picture because it shows vividly the tree inequities in Buffalo, where you can literally see the profound difference between the tree canopy on the east side and on the west side of Buffalo. Finally, thousands of unkept vacant lots litter the east side, and they negatively affect the community's quality of life and social well-being. For example, many of these vacant lots contain trash and debris or infested with rodents and overgrown with weeds. In many cases, uh, these uh, urban lots are filled with uh, uh, lead contaminants uh, of the soil. And moreover, this inner weaving of vacant lots, substandard houses, and owner-occupied housing drives the, the wealth and the value of the owner-occupied housing down. You can see from this particular map how those things are interwoven. And so the very way we build the east side create enormous barriers to wealth production uh, because of the ownership of the homes are all integrated and interrelated with these other negative forms of land use. Perhaps the most significant barrier to East Side development is that Black people do not own or control the land on which their community is developed. The location of Blacks on urban land means that neighborhood development and transaction and transformation, that's about real estate and real estate transactions. For example, the east side problem of unkept vacant lots stem from decisions that have been made from a series of Buffalo mayors from Frank Sedillo all the way to Byron Brown. And this decision to demolish thousands of housing units without simultaneously engaging residents in planning and developing neighborhood redevelopment strategies. Now, so the, 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 the problem was caused by the migration of thousands of workers, white workers, to the suburban homeownership zones. However, city leaders 
uh, created a zero-sum game when they recklessly used mass demolition to solve this problem by creating another equally passive dust and unhealthy situation, unkept faith in lives. Consequently, on the east side, unlike other sections of Buffalo, thousands of unkept residential vacant lots dominate the landscape. Therefore, you cannot develop these neighborhoods without at the same time repurposing the vacant lots and reconnecting them to the neighborhood built environment. The city of Buffalo owns about 7,000 vacant lots. Most of them own Buffalo's side. The problem is the city of Buffalo has no interest in using the ownership of these lots to spur neighborhood development. Instead, City Hall is becoming a land speculator that intends to sell these lots at or above market value. For example, the city of Buffalo sold to St. John's Church four vacant lots for $200,000. Says that those lots are appraised at $16,000. And they've done this before, they follow this at public meeting. Not far from that lot is another lot selling for $150,000, well above the assessed evaluation. And to add insult to injury, that's more than most of the houses in the proof belt are worth. City is a land speculator. Across the east side, speculators are selling strategically located vacant lots at inflated prices. This buying and selling is a form of what I call gentrification speculation and represent a significant barrier to east side uh, development. So the commodification of vacant lots illustrate the challenge of black community development on land that is owned and controlled by other people who have an agenda that has nothing to do with community development. A combination of systemic structural racism and the knowledge economy has locked most blacks in the low-wage sector of the economy. The medium household income for blacks is only $30,000. And 66% of black buffalo earn less than $45,000. So the knowledge economy, however, it didn't trap all Blacks in the low-income sector. The sociologist William Julius Wilson let us know that the knowledge economy will always propel a handful of Blacks into the middle class while pulling the masses down into the low-wage sector. So you have this phenomenon of uh, a rising black middle class and a falling black masses stuck in the low wage sector of the economy. And in this sector, about 44% of the workers could only find part time and seasonal work. Now understand this, to be in the labor market, you must be working or looking for work. If you're not working or looking for work, you're not in the labor market. 
So almost half the black workers who are looking for work and trying to find jobs can only get part-time or seasonal work. Now, many of them are working two, three, or four jobs to earn a living. And euphemistically, mystifically, whatever the word is, uh, call themselves gig workers. Gig workers mean you can't find one good job, so you take two or three uh, poor ones. Systemic structural racism is also a factor. Uh, in, in Buffalo, in Erie County, about 70% of all the jobs do not require a college degree. So there are significant working class jobs where you can earn a good living. So the problem is that white workers are overrepresented in the high end working class jobs, and blacks are overrepresented in the low end working class jobs. And then educational attainment has nothing to do with this. Large numbers of black finishing high school, a lot of them have some college but no degree. Racism is the only answer to that question. Barring you from union lead, uh, membership, not allowing you into apprentice program, and all other kinds of activities to shield black from competing with white workers. Now, since the release of the Hard We Run on September the 26, 2022, a new and insidious issue has made our root problem this. The planning and implementation of symbolic East Side projects. City leaders launched these symbolic projects to inspire hope and possibility. The problem is that these initiatives will produce sound and fury but not systemic and transformative change. Thus, in the end, they will signify nothing. For example, in recent months, New York State, in partnership with the city and the Buffalo Billions, allocated millions of dollars in projects targeting the east side. These symbolic projects included initiatives to develop five uh, 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 east side neighborhood anchors stimulate the development of four east side commercial corridors, Fillmore, Bailey, Jefferson, and Michigan, and provide funds to assist home ownership. City, the city leaders and their experts base these projects on the assumption that they will attract additional investments and catalyze each side development. The problem is that these kinds of projects never catalyze anything. For example, the $1 billion school construction effort was supposed to spur neighborhood development around the uh, rebuilt learning centers. It did not. The seven million for the splash pad and casino was supposed to catalyze development around Martin Luther King Jr. Park. It did not. The Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus was supposed to spur development throughout the fruit belt. It did not. And now we're told that investing $98 million in the Buffalo Central Terminal and the Broadway market. <laughs> suddenly magnificently transformed this neighborhood, neighborhood where the people earn $17,000 a year, and you look, you look at it on yourself. Some streets are only two or three houses. So I'm here to tell you, it will not catalyze anything. The point is that these symbolic projects are not denied. They create the illusion that something is going to happen when it is not. 
Moreover, they distract attention, talent, and resources away from solving the complicated root problems that hold back East Side social and economic development. The bottom line is that city leaders should move away from these symbolic projects and attack root problems. Not only this, not only this, But in the absence of a highly developed on-the-job training program, we can expect that the millions of dollars allocated for these symbolic projects will end up in the pockets of white owners and workers who will get the contracts to do the work. Within this market-centric pattern of development, Buffalo city leaders have quittingly or unwittingly turned east side development into a big jobs program for whites. And those millions of dollars will flow through the black community like water through a sieve on route to white suburban communities and neighborhoods. Look at this picture. They're redoing the historic Michigan Avenue Baptist Church. That's a white worker working for a white masonry company in Orchard Park market century development. So, what is to be done? Several principles should guide this work. The first is a shared commitment to residents of residents to control the community's land base and east side neighborhood development. Secondly, Neighborhood development must tether this strategy of controlling land and neighborhood development to community, not individual, community wealth building, collective work and responsibility, a mixed economic approach, cooperative ownership and participatory democracy. The third principle is to pursue a people-centric strategy based on equitable development, anti-gentrification, social and class inclusion, and social justice. The idea is to create a community that rejects class segregation and seeks to radically change what it means to be poor rather than a body. Understand what I'm saying? There is no magical law that says to be poor, you have to live in a rat infested house. That's company policy. There's no law that says poverty means you can't be educated. That's public policy. So quit trying to abolish poverty and change the policies that make being poor a living hell. That's our objective in the development of the side. Let me briefly talk about a handful of projects that I think will make a difference. The first is that we got to divide the east side into a series of planning districts. It's a big, complex project. project. Geography, so you want to break it down into these smaller planning districts and then institute individualized projects within a neighborhood context. Within this framework, the first project focuses, it focuses on gaining ownership and control of a significant portion of the east side land base. This calls for the establishment of a publicly funded community land trust. 
The land trust will take residential and commercial land out of the volatile private real estate market, and it will make equitable district, uh, development possible by diffusing gentrification speculation and forging new strategies and models of community development. It will also facilitate the fight against substandard housing by providing a vehicle for acquiring houses placed in receivership by the housing court and developing programs to rehabilitate, construct, and manage housing units. The land trust will also seek to encourage the city to transfer ownership of all of its each side vacant lots to the trust as a strategy for facilitating and bolstering neighborhood development. The substandard housing problem, characterized by rent gouging and unhealthy homes, is one of the top issues facing Black Buffalo. Renters dominate the east side, and most of them live in substandard housing units. So we have to create a strategy that will uh, uh, focus on transforming and changing the houses that people are actually living in and reducing the rents. The current strategy focuses on new builds. You cannot build your way out of this issue. You have to improve the existing housing units where people are living. So a key part of that is to establish across the county a good housing standard uh, in which no rental unit will be allowed to fall. And then develop a program of aggressive code enforcement combined with housing rehabilitation uh, to ensure that all east side housing is sold. All of this will require developing a fund of dedicated resources to uh, support housing we have and the subsidy, subsidizing of, of rents. The work to develop the green neighborhood green infrastructure has to improve, lead to improved sidewalks, curves, and the repurposing and connecting of vacant lots to neighborhood built to the neighborhood built environment. A number of activities along these lines could include infill housing, parking parks, and other low maintenance landscaping strategy. Uh, moreover, the city should be followed should prioritize the development of a green infrastructure that would ex, uh, consist of an extensive network of tree planting, establishing rain gardens to catch storm water, and the development of a network of shrubs and plants, especially in those neighborhoods uh, that are adjacent to major thoroughfares. One of the most uh, critical elements is, is the uh, development of on-the-job training programs. And here the idea is to connect job training uh, to black business development uh, and uh, uh, east side and the east side transformation. The redevelopment of the east side will produce an economy of scale. And if we create the kind of on-the-job training program that allows people to maximally participate in these activities, we will create a situation in which people will be allowed uh, to rebuild their neighborhoods as they rebuild their lives. And many of you know that that inclusiveness of all of these residents in that process, that many folks have a lot of social issues and problems. Uh, and so you have to connect this uh, with wraparound services and then connect programs to provide them with skills like literacy, which is hugely important and significant. That has to be tied with the process of job training and uh, development. If we do it this way, then the, the millions and millions of dollars that flow through the community will be captured by the community and reinvested in the community. I want to briefly talk about indicate that the issues that I have been talking about are social determinants of many of the undesirable health outcomes facing black Buffalo. We cannot abolish these health inequities without eliminating the neighborhood and socioeconomic conditions that breed them. 
So if you look at these figures, the kind of things that jump out of the premature death rate, almost twice that of the survivors. And when we look at the infant mortality rates and, and low birth rate, folks, these are third world numbers. It's online with what's happening in Jamaica and these locations and places. Then when we look at the asthma and respiratory issue, it concretizes this problem of air pollution and the like. So Black Buffalo has not made meaningful progress over the past few decades. And the city leaders do not change their approach to city building and neighborhood development. Black Buffalo will not make significant progress over the next 30 years. Now alone, the government cannot solve the problems facing Black Buffalo, but it can facilitate east side neighborhood transformation by attacking root problems and using its power and bullet pool fit to address Black Buffalo's greatest challenges and to focus the region's talent and resources on solving the most complex and urgent East Side problems. However, for this to happen, the city must abandon its flawed neighborhood development strategy. For example, the catalytic project idea will not work on the east side. An expanded home ownership will not stabilize neighborhoods. Moreover, <clears throat> commercial corridor development does not drive neighborhood development. Neighborhood development drives commercial corridor development. And comprehensive neighborhood planning is a prerequisite to neighborhood development and transformation. In closing, the problems facing Black Buffalo are complex. But what we have to do to attack them is not. We must confront the root problems facing Black Buffalo. The issues of substandard housing, disintegration of the neighborhood infrastructure, structural joblessness and low incomes, and the lack of control over the east side are producing the social determinants that are creating havoc in all other aspects of life. Buffalo will not make significant progress until city leaders cast away their illusions and attack these root problems. It is as simple as that. Nothing complicated. In the meantime, an authentic movement to develop and transform the East Side is growing and gaining momentum. So I remain optimistic, and I believe that another more democratic and racially just Buffalo is possible. We have a right to the city. Thank you.